The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples went into Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. You bow your heads with me in prayer, please. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this day that you have created and allowed us to share in. Lord, this morning, would you take our minds and think through them? Take my lips and speak through them? Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your son, Jesus? Take our wills and put them in submission to yours. In Jesus Christ's holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we've been recapping and recapping and recapping just so we don't forget where we were. So I'm going to do it again. These last four or five weeks, we talked about coming home to God, and everybody loved that part. Who doesn't love being in the presence of joy and peace? We talked about knowing the way to God. We realized that if we're going to go home, if we're going to know the way, then we have to know whose home it is and how to get there. So we talked about coming to know God. And we talked about once we come to know a little bit about God, we realize that God has a call on our lives to obey, serve, follow, proclaim, and love. And last week, we talked about the seriousness of this call, or at least we tried to impart the seriousness of the call that each one of us is to pick up and follow just like his first disciples. This whole kind of thing can be, you know, put into the phrase, the journey of faith. It is our our walk with the Lord, all of this put together. And today in Mark, we see more of this first journey, these first disciples who did this, who come to know God in Christ, who heed his call and start to follow him. And isn't it interesting in Mark, one of the first places that we see them going to church, well, to synagogue together. Jesus takes them into Capernaum and he begins to teach. And then... There's a demon. Yes, I said demon. Demon. Now, it's not a real fortunate choice today. The main two uh, scriptures we have, one's about getting meat to idols, the other's about demons. So you're pretty much out of luck. I'm giving you the official warning for a heavy sermon today because I decided meat and idols, eh, we're going to go with demons. So I'm just prepping you a little bit. And the reason is, is because I keep thinking about this journey of faith. Now, we don't exactly know how many days or weeks were between the first calling or this synagogue day. It could have been the same day. It could have been the next day. But we know it's close enough. And I have to wonder, did Jesus prepare them for this? Did he make them aware of the possibility that, by the way, when we go to synagogue and are teaching, there might be a demon? Because can you imagine how strange and off-putting that would be? There we are sitting in the midst of Jesus who's preaching in the authority of God because he's not talking about what the rabbi said or the scribe said or anybody else. He's talking about himself. He's the first person preacher. Who better to tell the story of God than Jesus? He is the word incarnate. And they're sitting there amazed and I can imagine the electricity through the room. And then, hey, you, Jesus, I know who you are, a demon. How strange and off-putting that must have been. I had the fortunate, I think, maybe is a safe word, ability to have been part of a somewhat similar experience. So I wasn't unprepared. And today, my sermon's central core theme, just so you're aware, is to make you aware, to prepare you for the possibility so that you are not uninformed about the reality of demons. 
I believe that demons exist in reality 100% for a variety of reasons. One is the scriptural witness. Two is the 2,000-year tradition and experience of the church. And three, because 11 years ago, I was in Egypt in a church and something happened. I went there with my seminary group to take a class on Middle Eastern Christianity, and we went to one of what are called the cave churches in Cairo near the garbage dumps. Now, those of you who don't know about anything in Egypt, the short version is it's very hard to build a Christian church. So some very intelligent, wise Christian decided, well, if we can't build a church, we can at least blow a hole in a mountain. So they blew holes in this mountain near the garbage dump, and they just went into the cave. And they were like, hey, government, we didn't build a church. We just blew a hole in a mountain. And they got away with it. So there's several cave churches, and they're beautiful places. And they're all the Orthodox Church, the Coptic Church in Egypt. So we went to worship with them. Now, it's about 500 people. So the space was three, four times the size of this. It's a big cave. But they do have chairs. There's a dais for the priest to stand on. And for the first two, we, two hours, two hours, two we stood and sang and praised God for two hours in Arabic, which none of us know. So you can imagine the, the, the energy and the excitement and the faith flowing through us for, you know, an hour. We're like, oh, Grace Church is done. I guess I can go home, right? And then it's another hour. And after a while, you're like, I really want to worship, but I don't understand any of the words. And now I'm getting tired because I'm just getting lost. Two hours. And it was beautiful, but it was hard. By the two-hour mark about, the priests come in, two or three of them, and the head priest gets up, and the actual service itself of Scripture and sermon begins. Another hour goes by. So those of you who are like, at 11.07, Charlie, you better be done, you know there are churches that are much longer. So we get up after, finally, it's like, okay, can we go talk English now? Praise God, right? And we're about to leave, and we notice a lot of people not leaving. And we see the priests go out into the, into the pews, into the chairs, and we see them start praying over people. And then we hear this loud noise, a woman screaming. And rightfully so, all of us were like, what's going on? And our Egyptian student guide said, oh, that priest is casting a demon out of that woman. And we all went, Ooh? excuse me? What's that? Oh, yeah, it happens here all the time. Demons are being cast out of people all the time and, brought to, and these people are being brought to Christ. And we were all like, oh, is that a normal thing in here? Because in Pittsburgh and Old Saybrook and Missouri, where I've lived most of my life, that doesn't really happen on a regular basis. And they said, yes, it happens. Now, I didn't hear any voice accusing Jesus or calling out Jesus' name. I didn't see any apparitions. But I'm inclined by the faith present in that room and the tradition of that church and the knowledge of the people who were there, including the priest who was using holy water and prayers over the person, that this was an actual casting out of a demon. It was strange. I was slightly unprepared for it. C.S. Lewis once said this. He says this in the preface to his book, The Screwtape Letters. Many of you maybe know about this book. It's a conversation between demons. And he says this in his preface. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race, humans, can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves, the demons, are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. And what C.S. Lewis is saying there is that most people either don't believe or get so heavily involved that they become occultists or Satanists or think that they are doing some sort of witching, Wiccan kind of thing where they're contacting the demons, or they go down that rabbit hole of, I'm going to fight and study and know all about the demons, or they just don't believe. Now, what I think Jesus calls us to, and I think the witness of the church, is we're supposed to be somewhere in between. And this is my kind of, again, goal of the day, is to be aware that demons exist and not be afraid and not go down the rabbit hole where we become magicians or obsessed with everything that happens to me as a demon. And so C.S. Lewis was trying to tease this idea of, if you've never read the screw tape letters, it is eye-opening. I highly suggest it. 
So I'm going to start from the premise that I, your pastor, believe in demons 100%. I don't know where you all stand or those of you out there, and I guarantee some of you don't believe or some of you are like, eh, I don't know. And I can't prove it to you, of course. What I'll simply say is this. By your faith in your presence here and online, what you are suggesting to the world and to yourself is that you have faith in God, in Christ, in the Holy Spirit, a God that you cannot see or touch or hear in actuality. So I suggest to you simply, if you can believe in that, why can't you believe in demons? So we see Jesus here today, and I imagine, I wonder, did he do that? Did he prepare them? Did Jesus not know maybe that there was going to be a demon? I wonder. While they were walking along the road, it's like, at some point, you're going to see demons. You should be aware of them. I like to hope that he did. I assume he did. But this first time must have thrown some of them off. But if you look at this short story, what the amazing thing is, is that there was not really any notice or worry about the demons. The big thing was the power and authority of Jesus himself. Wow! He teaches as one who has the authority. Wow, his authority even casts out demons. You notice Mark either didn't care or didn't note whoever passed this story down. Nobody was like, there was a demon, it was crazy, I was so afraid. And I suggest the reason for that is because the power and authority of Jesus was so preeminent and so manifest that there was no need to be afraid. He just said, get out. And people were like, okay, I feel safe in the presence of Jesus. The authority in our faith wraps us in, in safety and protection from the reality of what demons are about. I don't think any of you would be confused with that part, whether you believe or not. The devil and the demons exist in a reality in which they are after one goal and one goal only is to destroy the work of God, to disrupt it, to mess it up, to get Christians' lives as far away from Jesus as possible, however they can do that, to destroy God's work because they hate God. This is the truth of the work of the demons. And yet the power and authority of Jesus comes onto the scene, and then not only here, but through his work on the cross, what does he do? He overcomes the devil and his work. And in a sense, he prepared all of us for this possibility. I'm hoping that some of you will be waking up to this. Now, this authority that we see is wrapped around another part of the story that I want to make sure we don't miss. By the way, let's take a breather for a second. Charlie did say it was going to be a heavy sermon. Okay. Break. There's something in here that we have to note. Something that in the midst of the amazing authority and power of Jesus that we have to be aware of. You see, the reason that some would suggest that when I went to Egypt and other places like that around the world, in, in places that are in developing countries, parts of Asia, parts of Africa, maybe even some of Central America, demons are not unknown. In fact, they're more common than you would ever guess they are. And the suggestion has been made for a couple reasons why this is true. And the primary one is that where the light shines the brightest, it brings forth the most shadows. It shines into the darkness. This makes sense if you think about it. If the work of the demons and the devil is to destroy Christ and his work and to remove it, wherever that light shines the brightest, guess what? There's going to be more of the devils and the demons. So in a place like Egypt, where Christians are oppressed, minority, where they barely make enough money, where they're living in the garbage dump and building cave churches, their daily life, their faith walk with Christ is not stronger than ours, perhaps. It's not pure, perhaps. But it's set before them in a more real way. Now, I want to be careful that you notice what I'm saying. I'm not diminishing your faith in Jesus Christ. But for the majority of Americans, especially in our communities here, we don't have to get up each day wondering, am I going to be thrown in jail, killed, die, starve, whatever. In places like Egypt, in parts of Africa, and Asia, and Central America, they do. And as we talked about this last week, what happens if you remove everything out of your life and all you're left with is God? Well, that light then becomes brighter. And when the light is bright, the devil's like, no, I don't want the light. So it makes sense there would be more demons possessing and oppressing and being on the stage in countries like that. The sad note is the opposite is the second point. 
Perhaps our light in the materialist Western culture isn't as bright. I primarily speak of the United States and America. In countries where we have wealth and ease and comfort, where we have sin literally at our fingertips. Those of us who have phones in our pockets, the amount of sin that you can incur through a cell phone is astounding. And you can go anywhere with it. In a culture where they don't even have enough money to, to feed themselves, how are they getting on the internet or on their phone? How are they engaging in abject amounts of sin? Our culture thrives on the production of not only goods and services, but goods and services which open us up to the possibility of sin on a astounding and eternal scale. And when we live in a culture like that, you may have noticed a couple things have been happening, I think, to back me up. Churches are getting smaller. The number of people who believe is getting smaller. The morality of our nations and cultures in the West is changing. I've alluded to the fact that I think a lot of our division is because of this. Can I prove it? No, but I'm just making a guess. Again, with the availability for sin and the less need for the full brightness of Christ every day when we wake up, guess what happens? If there's less light, there's less work for the demons to do. If we're already distancing ourselves from God through our sinful materialistic culture, and again, I'm not speaking to any of you directly. This is a generalization. But if there's less light, there's less need for darkness. The demons are like, <laughs> I'm not even going to worry about you. You're doing the work for me. And the devil himself is like, demons, don't worry about America and Europe. Go to Africa and Asia and Central America where they're really, really, really in a relationship with me because they need me because they don't have anything else. Does this make sense? I could be blowing smoke. I hope I'm not. <laughs> we can talk about this, by the way, any other time. And so this puts us in a position Again, my core hope today is to be aware of the reality of the demons and the devil, to not be afraid, but be prepared for the possibility. Why? Did you notice what happens with this demon in the story today? Let me get to the right page. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. He cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. You noticed a couple things there, I hope. It appears that the demons know who Jesus is. They know what his work is about. And they submit to his authority. What does that sound like? Hmm. Our sermons the last four or five weeks come to know God, know what he's about, and submit to him. And the demon has possessed a man who in some form or another has gone into a religious service. Hold on a second. Charlie, what you're saying is that it sounds like Christians aren't the only ones who can know and submit to God and find God in a religious service. It's exactly what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that a demon can come after anyone at any time in any place which is, again, the crux of my sermon, to be aware of it and know about it, not be afraid of it, but to stand on the authority of Christ. Now, the church has taught and has in many different places that by your faith in Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are actually incapable of being possessed, an actual demon inside of you. Okay, it's not the exorcist. That movie ruined it for all of us. The church will teach and your faith will manifest that that can't actually happen. But what demons can do is oppress you. They can mess things up around your life. They can whisper, they can poke, they can prod, they can misdirect, they can lie. That's what they do. Sometimes when we're like, well, I don't need to go to church today. Sometimes when you're like, I'm tired, I don't need to pray. Sometimes when we do things and think things and say things, sometimes, not always, sometimes that can be the work of demonic beings. It's really hard to figure that out, which is why this is a hard slap the warning on sermon. But I want you to at least be aware of it. Now, I want to also be clear that my intent is not to, to make you afraid, to worry. I don't really think demons are coming after any of you on an obsessive multiple stage attack, although perhaps for some of you out there that is happening. I want you to be aware that there is a big big difference between us and the demons. 
Jesus says in Matthew, what? You will know them by their fruit. Yes, the demons may know God. They may submit to him and be able to enter your church. But there's no fruit. Because they don't have a relationship with Jesus. They're not loving and healing and forgiving. They're not casting out themselves as Jesus teaches in another part of the scriptures. The difference between us in faith and demons who know Jesus is that our lives reflect a relationship with Jesus. The fruit of that relationship. To forgive and heal and love and have mercy. The demons don't want any of that. Why? Because that's godly work. They hate that stuff. And so you will be known by your fruit. And that will distinguish you from the demons. Now, if you notice in the middle of this story is the demon, the recognition that they exist, that they can appear anytime, anywhere, to anyone. But if you notice what surrounds the rest of this story, I call each of you to be aware of this reality, but to not be afraid, to stand as the disciples and those in the synagogue did on the authority of Jesus, the power of God which not only overcomes and casts out demons, but even for those of us in the materialist West who are so possibly overrun by sin and don't need demons, he overcomes that as well. This is the good news. God has done this work for us, so we don't have to do it. God has overcome the devil. God works out the demons. God has overcome the sin. God has forgiven you your sin. This is godly work, which is why we are called to follow him why we are called not to give in to the obsession of the demons. So I call you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, to stand on the authority of Jesus, to proclaim his name and his truth so that the world and the demons shudder forever. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.